these things in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. Praise God. I want to invite you, if you will, to turn with me to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 17. <clears throat> and as you find your place there, you know, the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 12 that we're to renew our minds with the Word of God. The Bible says not to be conformed or made in order of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Why? So you can prove the perfect will of God. See, you cannot prove what you don't know. You can't make happen what you don't know. So God tells us that the, the very most important thing of a believer, once you've made Jesus Lord of your life, is to get your mind renewed and transformed by the Word of God. In Ephesians 4, the Bible teaches us that, that we're to put off this old man, which is corrupt and deceitful and full of the world, and we're to put on the new man created in righteousness and true holiness. How are we going to do that? By the renewing of the spirit of our mind. The attitude of our mind. We have to change our mind, change our attitude, change the way we see things. And put off the old conduct, the old life, the old lifestyle, the old way of thinking. And put on the new one that's created in righteousness and holiness and lives the way God wants us to live. Amen? How do I do that? By renewing my mind with the Word of God. All throughout the Scriptures, 3 John 2. Beloved, I pray that above all things you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. In other words, I can only prosper in the things of God as I renew my mind to them. You know, I'm reminded over in Hosea 4, 6, the Bible teaches in the Old Testament, God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, what you don't know, the devil will hold against you and use against you. Amen? Meaning what? Well, if you don't know that by Jesus' stripes you were healed, the devil will just put sickness on you and tell you God did it and hold you in bondage with it. Amen. And, you know, if you don't know that, that, that uh, you know, God sent the Holy Spirit to guide you in the truth and teach you, then the devil, he'll put you in some hard situation and say, God put you there to teach you. And he'll use your, your lack of knowledge against you. And so he'll keep you in bondage. But praise God, once the Word of God comes in, the Bible says the entrance of God's Word brings light. Amen. In other words, God illuminates us and shows us how to live, how to walk. Then we come out of the darkness and we come out of that bondage. We come over into the freedom of God's Word. And we begin to live differently, praise the Lord. So it's important that we get renewed in our mind, change the way we think. And what are we supposed to renew it to? The Word of God. Why? So I can think like have the attitudes of and the actions of God. I can act like my God. Amen. Paul said in Ephesians 5, 1, that we're to be imitators of God as dear children. So we're supposed to learn to act like God wants us to act. Think like God wants us to think. Well, in Ephesians 4, the Bible begins there in verse 11, goes on down, and says that God placed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What for? For the perfecting or the equipping or the training of the saints for the work of the ministry. Amen. In other words, God placed ministry gifts, and my main purpose or my main uh, function in this church is to equip you and train you with the Word of God. Why? So you can learn how to live in the way God wants you to live and walk in victory in your life, see? And so when you come to hear the Word of God, you come to be trained, equipped, and perfected so that God can move you out of where you've been and into a higher place and higher walk with Him, praise God. See, the Word of God does this. Jesus comes in our life and saves us from sin, saves us from an eternity of hell. But then the Word of God elevates our lifestyle up to the place God redeemed us to. Helps us to live in the victory that Christ has, has brought for us. So without the Word of God, you can't live in all the blessings of the Lord. But if you get a hold of the Word of God and begin to walk in it, change your mind, change your attitude, start doing it, you have to be a doer of it, then it begins to change your life, praise God. It begins to transform your life, and you begin to get victory where you had defeat. You begin to be an overcomer where you're being overcome. You begin to walk as more than a conqueror where you've been conquered before. And God begins to change outcomes in your life. And that's what it's all about. Amen. So as we get into the Word, and I teach you this Word, I want you to understand this is to change the way you think. This is to transform you and to bring you into a place where you can say, okay, Lord, I thank you for taking me out of a thought process that brought me in defeat and kept me in darkness and bring me into a thought process that brings me into light and victory in you, praise God. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to, to not see things in the wrong way, the way the devil wants me to see them, and help me to see the things the way you see them so I can do it the way you would have me to do it. Amen? And so it changes our life, and that's what God is for. Christianity is a constant process of transformation that takes place in our life. 
And so if we're not letting the Word transform us, then we're going to be stuck in a place, and that's as much victory as we're ever going to have. But praise God, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I want victory every day, and I want more victory every day. Amen? I'm thankful for what God has taught me, but I know there's plenty more that I haven't learned yet. And even some of the stuff he's taught me, there's more to learn about that too, praise God. He hasn't exhausted the subjects with me, praise God. In other words, I don't know all about faith that I know, should know, don't know all about salvation that I should know. There's more to be learned, amen? So here in Ephesians chapter 5, I want to teach you some things about praising God, about walking in God's praises and, and doing the things that God would have you to do. In Ephesians five seventeen. Paul writing to the church says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Aren't you glad God wants you to have an understanding of His will in your life? Amen? And then he begins to tell us what His will is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying God wants you to grasp his will and understand that he wants you to be filled with his spirit to the point that the Holy Spirit begins to direct your attitude and actions in life. In fact, the Amplified in verses 17, 18 reads like this. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish. Well, you see, if you don't know God's will... If you don't know God's Word, then you're going to live your life vague and thoughtless and foolish. Amen? In other words, you're going to make foolish decisions. You're going to, you're going to live in a, 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 a place of vagueness, a place where you're, you don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe you're going to live in a place where, you know, I don't know if this will work or not. Well, God wants you to be brought out of indecision, and He wants you to be brought over into an absolute, praise God. And so he says this, but that you firm, understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Then listen to what he says, and do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. But ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Now, what's, what's he saying here? He's saying you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you see, a lot of Christians get filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's as far as they go. Here, Paul in the Amplified brings it out. He says, be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. What's he mean, stimulated with the Holy Spirit? Well, you could say it like this. Be motivated by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Something stimulates you, it motivates you, doesn't it? So he says, don't just have the Holy Spirit living in you, not doing anything. Let him be the motivation of your life. Amen. Or you could say stimulate being, being uh, led by the Spirit. Okay. In other words, let the Holy Spirit lead you in your actions. Or you could say it like this. 1 John 2.20 says, but you have an unction or an anointing from the Holy One. So you say be filled with the Spirit, ever filled, walking in the Spirit, and, and be unctioned by the Spirit. What's he saying? He's saying the Holy Spirit should be the dominant influencer in your life. I'm going to say it again. The Holy Spirit should be the dominant influencer in your life. He should have the dominion in influencing you. Now, what's he saying? He's saying be filled with the Spirit, be stimulated, be led by, be unctioned by, be, be uh, you know, directed by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because if you're not being directed by the Holy Spirit within, you're being directed by the circumstances from without. So he's saying, learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and whenever something comes up, let the Holy Spirit stimulate or activate in you the right response. Learn to live from the inside out, not from the outside in. Because, you see, if you don't understand this and grasp this, then every time you find yourself in a situation, that situation determines your attitude and actions. Find yourself in a bad situation, what do you do? All of a sudden, you're oppressed, you're depressed, you're defeated, you're murmuring, you're complaining, you're giving up, you're throwing your hands up, and, 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 it's, and it's directing your actions and attitude because the outward man is controlling the inward man because you're being stimulated by the problem and not by the problem solver. Amen? So God says, here's what my will for you is. I want you to be filled with the Spirit. I want you to walk in the Spirit. And I want you to also let the Holy Spirit activate within you the very reactions and actions that you're supposed to have in all walks of life. Praise God. 
Amen? And so then he begins to get in verses 17, or uh, verses 19 and 20, he begins to talk to us then about some of the responses the Holy Spirit is going to bring into us and release in us as we walk with God, as we do the things God would have us to do. So he says, be filled with the Spirit, be stimulated by the Spirit, be unctioned by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit activate in you the responses to the situations you're in. And so he says, here are the responses the Holy Spirit's going to give you. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you know you're going to have to have the Holy Spirit helping you to do that? Amen. Because if you find yourself in a situation, you're usually not speaking out good things. Not if, you're, not if you're not being led by the Spirit because you find yourself in a situation speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and encouraging one another and speaking out the good things of God, you might find yourself complaining to one another or speaking out the problem or the situation. And instead of singing songs of praise unto God, you could be singing songs of defeat and failure. And instead of giving thanks to God, you could be grumbling to God. Amen. So what does he say? Here's God's will for you. Get filled with the Spirit, but just don't ask the Holy Spirit to come in and be a guest in your house and ride to heaven with you. Amen. The Holy Spirit is not just a hitchhiker you picked up one day on the way to heaven and you invite him to ride in the back seat of your life. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be your helper, your new comforter, your strength. They're the one that's, that's come to take Jesus' place to help you to make right decisions in life and live for God. He's supposed to be active in your life. Isn't that right? So we begin to invite the Holy Spirit to help us to do the right things before God. And the right things before God is going to be living a life of praise unto our God. Amen? Because he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've already found out in studying some things on praise and being led by the Spirit that Psalm 22, 3 says that God inhabits the praises of Israel or God inhabits the praises of his people. Isn't that right? In other words, as I praise God and I speak and sing and thank God and praise God and let the Holy Spirit direct my actions, God begins to come into that situation. To inhabit means to dwell in, means to come into. Isn't that right? So if I want to feel God's presence, what I need to do, I need to begin to speak, sing, and thank the way God wants me to. It'll bring his presence. Now, in Matthew 21, we saw where Jesus, when he went in and cleaned out the temple and, he, and, and you know, healed the people, that the people were praising him and thanking him. The scribes, Pharisees came to him and said, do you hear what these are saying? He said, yes, I hear what they're saying. And then he reads that back to him. He says, have you not ever read how in the word of God, the Bible says that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise? And he's quoting Psalm 8 too. But if you go to Psalm 8, 2, you find that David says it like this, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected strength. Jesus didn't quote it and say strength. When he quoted that scripture, he said praise. So you take the two together and you say praise releases the strength of God. Amen? So as I praise God, I'm releasing the strength or the power of God or the presence of God in that situation. Now, Psalm 8, 2 also says that you release the strength of God and you steal the enemy and the avenger. Meaning what? As I praise God, I bring God's presence into that. The New King James says in Psalm 22, 3 that God is enthroned in the praises of his people. So that means God takes lordship or he takes the place of higher position when we praise him. Amen? Meaning what? When I begin to praise God and let the Holy Spirit help me in any situation I'm in, and I begin to magnify the Lord, and I choose to approach this with an attitude of praise, not an attitude of defeat, an attitude of thanksgiving, not an attitude of why me, Lord, but I begin to let the Holy Spirit direct my actions, and I praise God. The Bible says God comes in and is enthroned in that praise. His presence comes into that praise. And when God's presence comes in, it shuts the devil's mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It steals the enemy. In other words, it brings peace in the turmoil. Brings calm in the situation, praise God. And God begins to be enthroned instead of the problem. How many of you would rather have Jesus enthroned in that situation than the problem enthroned? Because whoever's on the throne is dictating the policy. So when I put the Lord in charge, he begins to determine the outcome. And he begins to magnify himself. And he begins to put the enemy on the run. And I begin to see God's power operating in my life. So what I want to do is this. As we 
study the Word of God, we begin to see the, the, the importance of praise and the importance of responding from the man on the inside by the help of the Holy Spirit, not responding by the outward circumstances that are confronting us because when I respond from the inside, I release God to work for me. When I respond from the outside, I let the devil work against me. Amen. And so we need to see how God wants us to praise him because, you see, if praise is this important, if praise brings the presence of God, if praise brings God's power, if praise puts the enemy on the, on the run, if praise releases the anointing of God in my life, then I need to learn how to do it and be efficient in it and, and do it the way God wants me to do it and be accurate in it so that God will accept it. Amen? Because if it's his praise, I need to learn what he likes. Amen. I mean, if you get in my car, you're going to listen to the station I like. <laughs> Don't get in my car and turn it over some crazy whatever, you know. Because it's my car, you're going to listen to my music. <laughs> Amen. Don't bring your crazy whatever or, you know, your twangy whatever or whatever you're going to bring CD and put it in my CD player. <laughs> if I wanted that, I'd have it in my car already. <laughs> And see, a lot of times we treat God the same way. Here, God, here's the way I want to do it. Take this. I don't know about you, but I've heard some stuff before. I just want to put my finger in my ear. Oh, God, they call that music. I wonder if God sets up in heaven and goes, oh, man, they call that praise. Huh? Because, you see, the Bible says, let, let, let's, let's look at it real quick. I, I quoted it before, but let's, let's look in, in Psalm 33 real quickly. As, as I was studying this out, this, 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 just, this psalm just jumped out at me. Psalm 33, verse 1. I want you to see what he says here. Reading this out of the New King James, he reads it like this. Psalm 33, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. In other words, I'm, I, I'm to rejoice. I'm the righteousness of God. I, I'm right standing with God. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Now listen, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? For praise from the upright is beautiful. In other words, God takes that and makes it a beautiful thing. Whenever we begin to praise him the way he wants to be praised, it becomes a beautiful thing in the eyes of God. Begins to bring his glory into that situation. And it's good for us to, to, to be able to praise him. So, so we're going to look at nine biblical ways that we can praise the Lord in a way that's beautiful in his sight. Hallelujah. They can turn the situation around. They can release his power, and God will be well pleased with us. Amen. The first three are found right here in Ephesians 5, 19, and 20. And that is speaking, singing, and giving thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, if you're going to praise God, you're going to have to get a hold of your mouth. You're going to have to get a hold of your talk. You're going to have to understand what praise really is. Because, you see, praise is an expression from our heart to God. Did you hear me? Praise is an expression from my heart to God. It's an expression. If it's not expressed, it's not praise. Some people say, well, I'm praising God in my heart. Got an old sourpuss face, and they're standing there and won't get a word out, and they just look like somebody just stole their prize, you know. And, and so they're standing there, oh, I've got praise in my heart. No, 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 liar, liar, pants on fire. You aren't. Somebody says, well, how can you say that? Because in Matthew 12, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I've got praise in my heart, then my mouth will express it. Amen. Also, it'll show up on my face, praise God. Because over in Proverbs, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Another one says there in Proverbs around the 13th chapter, it says, A merry heart it causes a cheerful countenance. Hallelujah. So if I've got praise in my heart, guess what? I'm going to put it on my face. I'm going to express it with my mouth. David said it like this in Psalm 103, speaking out praise. He said, Psalm 103, he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Then he says in verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul and forget not all of his benefits. And then he begins to praise him by saying, who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases, who redeems my life from destruction, who crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies, who, who satisfies my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. And he goes on down later and he says, and he has taken my sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. And he just begins to praise God and magnify him for all that he's done. 
See, you and I need to learn that when we get into a situation, whether it's a good or bad, we need to put praise in our mouth and begin to declare the good things of God. Praise is speaking out the word. Praise is speaking out the greatness of God. Then notice he says singing, praise the Lord. We need to get to singing and praising God with our voice. You need to learn. He says singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, there are times that you, 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 know, you can just g- grab an old hymn and begin to sing, How Great Thou Art, Standing on the Promises, Amazing Grace, or whatever, as you're just going about and praising God, singing it out of your heart, ministering unto the Lord. You can sing choruses, hallelujah, or you can sing, the courses we sang today and minister to the Lord, speaking out and singing praises unto God. You cannot bring the presence of God singing Folsom Prison Blues and Jack the Knife. Amen. You have to change the songs that you're singing, praise God. You have to learn that if I want the God's presence to come in, I need to sing some of the songs that God likes. Hallelujah. Because if he's going through the stations, he's going to pick up the one he likes, praise God. And I'm going to have him to, so I'm going to sing his songs and praises unto him. Then notice the third way of singing praise unto God is, is thanksgiving, offering thanks. Getting up in the morning saying, thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for being my God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you, Lord God, for helping me to fight through battles today. Thank you for never leaving me nor forsaking me. Thank you that I can always count on you being there for me. Though a thousand fall on my side and ten thousand on my right hand, it will not come near me because you are my shield and my buckler. You're my strong tire. You're my righteous God, and you're my God. And I thank you for being there with me. Hallelujah. When something good takes place, we thank him and praise him for it. And we begin to offer up thanks unto our God. So we learn that, that these are biblical methods. These are instructional methods. You know, what we've got to learn is this. There, there are Bible ways from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament that are consistent. And we need to learn those ways of ministering praise unto God. There are also sovereign praises. That, that there are times when the Spirit of God comes on you and you'll just praise him and, and, and just minister to him. And you can find certain places like that in the Bible. You know, uh, a sovereign praise would maybe be a run. You know, David uh, talks about he could run through a troop and leap over a wall, but that's when the anointing of God came on him. Because the anointing ain't on you, you'll run into the wall and get beat by the troop. Amen? (laughs) Amen. You know, Elijah, the anointing came on him. He outrun the king's chariot 17 miles across the valley of Jezreel. But if the anointing ain't on you, you can't run no half marathon. Amen? So every now and then, the anointing might get on it. You know, David says, when, when they, they turn our captivity, then we were filled with laughter and our mouths were singing. You know, there are times there's a holy laughter, but that's not, that's not the norm. That's a, that's a supernatural move. That's a sovereign praise of God. Amen? And we're open to everything. Just like the, 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 but the trouble is, if you're waiting on a sovereign praise with God, then the trouble with that is this. You'll be like the fellow that was 38 years at the pool of, Beth, uh, of Siloam uh, waiting on the water to trouble so he could get in. He said, every time the water moves, somebody beats me in. And, you know, that's the trouble with us. You know, the Spirit of God got to move, and I was about to move with it, and then it quit. If they'd have done it one more time, I'd have jumped up and run. No, you wouldn't. Somebody beat you to it, and you'd had to wait till the next time. And so we find ourselves waiting on some special something before we praise God. But the Bible teaches us we should be praisers every day of our life. And he teaches us how we should praise, biblical praise, that's always pleasing unto the Lord. So let's look at a few more. We've got speaking, singing, and thinking. It's a theme that runs through. Look over in Psalm 63, the 63rd Psalm. Let's look over here. This will help us as we look into some of these scriptures. Psalm 63, we'll look at, first of all, in the King, New King James in, in, in verses 3 and 4. Listen to what he says here, talking about praising the Lord. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Hallelujah. Notice that. He says, Lord, your loving kindness is better than life itself, and I'm going to praise you with my lips. I'm going to express my praise to you and thank you for your loving kindness. And then he says this, thus will I bless you while I live, while you're alive. You praise him. Then here's another way you praise him. I will lift up my hands in your name. See, a lot of people say, why do y'all lift your hands up? Is that a charismatic thing? No, it's a Bible thing. Hallelujah. 
See, lifting up your hands, ministering to the Lord, is a Bible way. All throughout the scriptures, you'll find that people lifted their hands and lifted their voices unto God and praised Him and magnified His name. In fact, Psalm 63, verses 2 through 4 in the Message Bible brings it out real clear, and he says it this way. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? I'm standing here with my eyes wide open, don't care who's seeing me. I'm drinking in your praise. I'm drinking in your glory. I'm in a place of worship unto God. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. In other words, my lips are just so full of praise, it's just like a fountain flowing out of me. Then listen to what he says. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. Isn't that good? In other words, Lord, I'm praising you, and my hands are just waving, and I'm just standing here magnifying you. My eyes are wide open, but I'm not seeing anybody around me. I'm seeing you. I've entered into a place of worship where I'm not concerned about the problem anymore. I'm not concerned about people anymore. I'm not worried about what the devil said. I've just entered into a place of worship with you, and my mouth is filled with praises and my hands are lifted up and I'm praising and thanking you for your great mercy for my life. Amen? See, that's a Bible way that we praise the Lord. Let's look over in Psalm 134. It goes right along with this. Psalm 134. Listen to what David says over here. Good stuff, isn't it? Amen? Psalm 134, David says here in verses 1 and 2, Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in, his, in, the, in the house of the Lord. Notice that we're to bless the Lord all the time. Verse 2, how am I going to bless him? Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Somebody says, well, I do this at home, but I don't feel comfortable in the church. Well, he said, bless the Lord in the sanctuary, just like you bless him at home. Amen. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. So somebody says, why do you at this church lift up your hands so much? Because the Bible teaches us that's a biblical way that pleases God, that's beautiful unto the Lord, that is good for us to do, and it brings glory to him, and it's a way that I can bless him. And I can thank Him. And I can magnify Him. I can wave my hands. I can lift my hands. I can praise God and worship God out of my mouth with my hands lifted up to Him. Also, hands lifted up is an act of surrender. I'm submitted to God, surrendering to God, and I'm declaring Him the champion. Hallelujah. But also, lifting up of hands is also a sign of victory. What happens to somebody whenever they're running? You, you, you ever seen these runners? It doesn't matter whether they're running 100 meters or they're running a, a triathlon, triathlete, you know, Ironman triathlete, uh, whatever. <laughs> triathlon. That's what I'm trying to get across. I mean, these guys swim farther than I can run, <clears throat> ride a bicycle farther than I can drive a car, <laughs> and then run a marathon. And here they come running across that finish line. You ever seen what they look like when they run across the finish line? Hands are up. Ah! If I ever tried to do that, I would be coming across, but I would not have my hands up. I'd have my hands out. Help! <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But what do they raise their hands for? It's because they're celebrating victory. They're celebrating victory. You ever seen some of these guys, you know, whenever they go across the goal line, they score a touchdown, they throw their hands and, yes, right up in the air. They high-five. They don't low-five. They high-five. Why? They're celebrating victory. What's lifted up of hands? I'm celebrating my victory over the devil. I'm celebrating my salvation in Christ Jesus. I'm celebrating that if I take my last breath right now, I go to heaven. Hallelujah. I'm worshiping God because he's made me more than a conqueror, and I'm an overcomer in this life, and I'm expressing that unto my Lord. Amen? So we bless the Lord with our mouth. We also bless the Lord with uplifted hands. But there's another thing you can do with your hands. Psalm 47. Look over here real quickly. Psalm 47 and verse 1. David brings this out to us, something you can do with your hands that, that you see. Praise God. A lot of people wonder what this is all about. Well, he says in verse 1 of Psalm 47, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. What's that mean, all you peoples? Peoples, plural, meaning everybody, all nations, all peoples. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. What's he talking about? He's saying you, there are times that you just clap your hands, you get excited and praise God, and you're just shouting and magnifying the Lord because you're expressing to God. See, the Bible talks about in Psalm 100, make a joyful noise. One, one translation says, make a joyful shout. Hallelujah. Every now and then you just want to make a noise unto the Lord. 
And you clap your hands and you praise him. Psalm 47, 1 in the Amplified reads it like this. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph and songs of joy. Isn't that good? Meaning what? There are times I clap my hands when I'm singing because I'm involved in the praise. I'm worshiping God. I'm magnifying the Lord. I'm exalting him with all the other people by clapping my hands, making a joyful noise, and shouting unto God with a voice of triumph and the voice of praise. Hallelujah. Then look in the 150th Psalm. David tells us all of these things, and then he gets over here, praise God, the 150th Psalm. And he begins to tie all these things together for us. Psalm 150, beginning in verse 1, he says, Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, the King James says. Actually, the Hebrew says, Hallelujah. Amen. And there's an exclamation part. So David's shouting out, Hallelujah. Every time you shout, Hallelujah, you're shouting, Praise the Lord. Then he says, Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament, the expanse of His heavens, praise God. Praise Him in, in everywhere you're at. And then He tells you in verse 2 why you're to praise God. He says, praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to the excellent, His excellent greatness. Hallelujah. There are two reasons I should be praising God today. Number one, I praise God for His mighty acts, for what He's done for me, what He's going to do for me, and, and all the things He's brought me through. I just begin to praise Him and shout and clap my hands, lift my hands, and magnify His name. But then also, I'm to praise God for His excellent greatness. What's that mean? I'm just supposed to praise God because He's great. And praise is beautiful for the upright. It's comely for the upright. It's a wonderful thing for the upright. And it's a joy to praise him. So I praise God because he is God. I praise him because he's mighty and wonderful. I praise him out of my heart and declare he's my Lord and my God. And I magnify his name. Then in verses 3 through 6, he begins to tell us how to praise him. He says, praise him with. Notice he says with. These are things you praise him with. Hallelujah. You praise him with the sound of the trumpet. We need some trumpet players. You praise him with the lute and the harp. We need some string players. He says, praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and flutes. Notice I jumped over dance. Hallelujah. Why? Because a lot of traditional religious folks have a problem with dance. They have a problem with guitars. They have a problem with drums. They have a problem with clapping your hands. They have a problem with lifting their hands. So they might as well go ahead and talk about dance since they have a problem with everything anyway. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes people look at this word dance, and, you know, I've even read different translations where they talk about, you know, the instrument of dance, and, and they try to, but you know what? I looked it up in the Hebrew. I did. And you know what it means in Hebrew? Dance. Hallelujah. <laughs> it, it's a dance. It's a spiritual dance. It's not doing the boogaloo or whatever, you know. But it is a spiritual dance. It's a moving of your feet. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a leaping, a twirling. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, the Bible says that David, when they were, you know, they were marching into Jerusalem and bringing the different things and, and the victories and the ark and, and stuff, and David had on his ephod and he's dancing. And the Bible says he twirled and he leaped and he praised God. And whenever his wife didn't like it, he turned to her and said, it was for the Lord. It wasn't for your sake anyway. I don't care if it bothers you or not. You're not the one that's given me the victory. You're not the one that's caused me to be an overcomer. I'm not doing this for your applause or your, or your scrutiny or your approval. I'm doing this unto the Lord. Hallelujah. And you see, praise, folks, has to come from my heart with an attitude. I'm not embarrassed of the Lord. I'm not ashamed of the Lord. I'm not going to deny the Lord. Whether it's with stringed instruments, with the guitars, or whether it's with the, the loud cymbals and the clashing cymbals. Some people say, oh, that music's just too loud with them drums up there. Well, he talks about, one translation says, with the, the loud drums and cymbals. Hallelujah. So we've got stringed instruments, we've got keyboards, we've got all these. But you know something? Because all these are instruments of praise. You praise the Lord with these things. You praise Him with your dance. You praise Him with your hands lifted. You praise Him with your mouth. You praise Him with songs. You praise Him with thanksgiving. You praise Him by speaking out His blessings. 
These are methods of praising him. But notice this. You praise him with. These things are not praise. These are things, are instruments of praise. Meaning what? If I'm singing and shouting and clapping my hands to show you how spiritual I am, it's not praise. It's, an, it's a show to you to draw attention to me of how spiritual I am. Praise is not for your sake. Praise is to God. And, and so I can be up here and I can be singing unto the Lord, have the best voice. And, and people, every time I sing, I'm like, oh, so great. But if I'm singing to get people to know what a great voice I have, it's not praise anymore. Because it was for my applause. It was for me. Re remember, all this praise is for God. And I can be up here and I can be playing the guitar and I can be hitting the, the notes and I'm, and I'm like, wow, you can really play. Well, if that's all I'm doing it for, then that's all the reward I get. I should be playing those notes and stuff because I want to be a minstrel unto my God. I want to be a, I want to be a musician unto my God. I want, I want to take this instrument and turn it into an object of praise, an instrument of praise, so that when God hears it, it's a sweet-smelling savor coming before him. When I lift up my hands, my hands become instruments of praise. So when God looks at me, he sees my hands lifted up in sincerity, honesty, and, 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 and humility, and I'm worshiping him because I want him to see my hands lifted up to him. When I'm shouting and clapping my hands and praising God, I don't care if you hear it or not. I don't care if I'm on the beat. I don't care if I'm out of rhythm with everybody else because I'm not doing it to join in with you. I'm doing it to praise my God. Amen. Some people say, well, you know, I just don't sing that well. Well, that's wonderful. God has a word for you in the Bible, Psalm 100. It, 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 you know, let everybody make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. So if you can't sing, just make a joyful noise. Say, God, I'm offering this up. I know it's not in, in rhythm. I know it's not on key. So you just have to take it and put some melody to it. Hallelujah. But it's from the heart. And then finally David says this, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody says, I just don't know if I can do that. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to get me a pocket mirror, and I'm going to come around, stick it under your nose. And if it fogs up, you're breathing. Hallelujah. And you qualify to be a praiser. Hallelujah. Because you said that everything that has breath Praise the Lord. With my breath, every breath, David said in that one song, I will praise you. I will worship you. Then he finishes up by saying, praise the Lord. He ends it up again by saying, hallelujah. In other words, he's saying, make your life a praise life unto God. Make all that you are, your voice a praise, your words a praise, your, your attitudes a praise, your, your instruments a praise, the clapping of your hands a praise, everything about you, make it a praise unto God, and God's presence will come in, and God's power will come in, and God's anointing will come in. And 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty and emancipation from bondage and freedom. Hallelujah. Whenever God's presence comes in, what's he do? He sets you free. He becomes enthroned in that situation. Fear goes out the door and faith and hope comes in. And all that turmoil goes out and peace takes over and rules your mind. And all of a sudden, instead of despair, you've got hope. And instead of saying, what am I going to do? You're saying, my God's going to get me through this thing. Amen. And God begins to bless you. See, we're all to be instruments of praise unto our Lord. And you know, there's one other way that we can praise God too. It's found in 1 Corinthians 14. Look over here real quickly. I want you to see this. This will help you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You can get filled with the Holy Spirit. You can pick it up here in, in verse 12. He says this, Even so you, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. In other words, he said your attitude should be, I want the church to experience God's presence. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come in and be a part of a great praise group. I'm going to do my part because, you see, I want God to be glorified in the church. So he tells me I can praise God individually, but I can be a part of a corporate praise also. And whatever I'm doing is so that God will excel in the church and the church will grow and the church will be blessed. Because, folks, where the corporate anointing is, there's great miracles take place. 
When we praise God, individually and collectively, it brings His mighty presence into the place. And miracles can take place. God's power is felt and lives are changed. That's why we praise Him in the sanctuary. But then you can also do this. He says this. Verse 14, for those that have been filled with the Holy Spirit. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, he says, he says, if I've been filled with the Holy Ghost and received my prayer language, I can pray in the Spirit. But then he says this, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding also. What is he saying? You know, you can sing in the Spirit. There are times that you may not know what to say. And you can just lift your voice up and just begin to sing out in your heavenly language and worship God and praise Him in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can help you to praise Him like that. That's why everybody should get filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't get filled with the Holy Ghost so you can jump over pews and run around the building. You should be doing that without. You should do that because you got born again of the Spirit. You get filled with the Holy Spirit so you can be in do with power. You get filled with the Holy Spirit so He can help you to go on over into another place with God that you can't get on your own. But you can praise Him in the Spirit. So we praise Him with our words. We praise Him with songs. We praise Him with thanksgiving. We praise Him with uplifted hands. We praise Him with our clapping of our hands. We praise Him with our instruments. We praise Him in the dance. We praise Him with a shout. We praise Him with our heart. And when we do, God is enthroned in those praises. Meaning what? When I find myself in a situation of conflict, I have to choose. Am I going to let the circumstances determine what I say and how I do? Or am I going to let the God on the inside of me determine what I say and how I do? Now, if I let my circumstances determine my words and actions, they'll be enthroned in my situation. And I'll stay in depression, defeat, whatever. But if I let the Holy Spirit direct me, and even though I don't feel like it, I begin to speak out the blessing of the Lord. Even though I don't feel like it, I lift my hands up to God. Even though I don't feel like it, I begin to praise Him and thank Him and declare His goodness over my life. I begin to sing out to Him songs that that come up out of my spirit. Songs that God reminds me of, of His goodness and of His mercy. Choruses, worship songs, whatever. All of a sudden, instead of the problem having dominion over my mind, the problem controlling my attitude and actions, Jesus is enthroned in that situation. Jesus comes in and says, devil, move over. I'm taking it. And Jesus comes in and begins to release his anointing, his power, and his presence. And the enemy's defeated. And God is glorified. And what was ugly becomes something beautiful. Isn't it great we can take an ugly situation and turn it into a beautiful situation by bringing God's presence in it? I don't know about you. There's enough ugly in the world without me creating more. I want to, I want to create some beauty in my life. How do I do that? By letting the Holy Spirit turn me into a praiser. Responding from the unction of the Spirit of God and letting Him stimulate out of my mouth good things. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you.